The Strange Case of Dr Jekyll and Mr Hyde. This is a literature short. These are short videos to revise each chapter of Jekyll and Hyde. In this video, we're going to look at chapter nine, Dr Lanyon's narrative. We'll look briefly at the events of the chapter and then at some of the language used. And while you're here, please subscribe to get updates on future videos. Thank you. Now, before we look at the events, let's remind ourselves that this is an epistolary novel. Much of it is made up of letters and documents, which together form the evidence for us to understand what has happened. Not all of it is epistolary, but we can still approach it with an understanding that Stevenson uses many documents in the novel to help us piece together the events. Now, some students find this confusing, especially when there are envelopes inside envelopes, so I'll be really clear about each piece of evidence that appears in this chapter. The chapter is entitled Dr Lanyon's Narrative, and remember that this was given to Utterson by Lanyon in an envelope. On opening the envelope, he found another envelope inside with the clear instruction not to be opened till the death or disappearance of Dr Henry Jekyll. It is this document that we now have access to in this chapter. The opening of the chapter, where we see the first person pronoun in the line I received by the evening delivery of registered envelope, that pronoun, I, is referring to Lanyon. Now, let's look at the events. The chapter starts with Lanyon's voice, so he describes how he received a letter from Henry Jekyll and he includes the contents of the letter. The letter asks Lanyon to take a cab to Jekyll's house and force open some locked drawers. The phrase actually used is a glazed press, which these days we'd probably refer to as a cabinet or a chest of drawers, and the glazed part simply means that it had glass windows in part of it. The letter asks Lanyon to remove one specific drawer and bring it, and all of its contents, to Lanyon's home at Cavendish Square. Jekyll's letter tells Lanyon to expect a visitor who will collect the drawer and its contents. The letter also warns that if Jekyll doesn't do this, he may cause Jekyll's death or perhaps damage to Jekyll's mental health. Lanyon's narrative explains that he then completed this task as required. Lanyon also explains that he inspected the contents of the drawer and among them he found powders, a blood red liquor, a book full of dates and brief remarks and a file of salt. Lanyon is both confused and unnerved by this. He explains that he sent his servants to bed and loaded a gun. At midnight, a small man in oversized clothes knocks at his door. Lanyon finds him distasteful to look at, and despite the man's oversized clothes, Lanyon is not drawn to laughter in any way. The man is impatient, and when Lanyon indicates the drawer, the man, who the reader clearly understands to be Edward Hyde, springs on it and goes about measuring out some powder and liquid. Hyde gives Lanyon the option to witness what will come next, or remain in the dark. Lanyon says that he's come too far with inexplicable services to not see what will happen next, and agrees. Hyde reminds Lanyon of their professional vows. Essentially, Hyde swears Lanyon to secrecy, and then he drinks the potion. Lanyon suffers deep and traumatic shock to witness the change of Hyde into Jekyll. Lanyon states that Jekyll stayed and explained everything to him, but Lanyon writes that he cannot bring himself to write it down. The chapter draws to a close with Lanyon's declaration that the shock will kill him, and that Jekyll is Hyde. Now, let's move over here to look at some of the key features and language used in this chapter. At the start of this chapter, the narrative voice has shifted to that of Dr Lanyon. This in itself is interesting, because until this point, the novel has been narrated by that anonymous third-person voice, and the story has largely centred on Utterson's perspective. In this chapter, chapter 9, that has shifted to the singular perspective of Dr Lanyon, which in itself is a little jarring for the reader. It's unsettling after eight chapters to be presented with a new perspective, so the tension is heightened as we near the conclusion of the novel. Let us now turn to Jekyll's letter. Jekyll starts by declaring to Lanyon that he cannot remember any break in their affection, and he describes how he would sacrifice his left hand to help Lanyon, such are the depths of their friendship. The letter then springboards from this emotional plea into clear demands of Lanyon, 
and despite the opening of the letter, we get the sense that Jekyll is perhaps taking advantage of Lanyon's good nature. Indeed, in chapter two, we learn that Lanyon felt that Jekyll had become wrong in mind over ten years before, and you'll remember that Lanyon suggested that Jekyll's attitude would have estranged Damon and Pythias, the epitome of a loyal friendship in Greek legends. So although Jekyll claims in this letter that they only differ on scientific questions, it seems that Lanyon's memories differ. This makes Jekyll's letter feel manipulative because he's drawing on an old loyalty which was perhaps lost long ago. Jekyll asks Lanyon to postpone all other engagements to help him. Jekyll describes how Lanyon must act. Jekyll writes, you are to go in alone. And Lanyon is given a series of very direct instructions. The tone here feels demanding and controlling. If Lanyon completes the instructions, Jekyll tells him, you will have played your part and earned my gratitude completely. There's something about the phrase, played your part, here, which is worthy of consideration. We get the sense that Jekyll sees his life, or at least his current state, as a drama, surrounded by actors playing their parts on his stage. This strikes me as indicative of a detached state of mind. Not only is he utilising others to achieve his own ends, but the reference to their playing a part feels as though he's watching this all unfold before him with blunted emotions and detachment from reality. He's also unconcerned by the impact that his behaviour has on others. There are a couple of other interesting details to look at in this chapter. If we look to his postscript, that's the PS on the letter, he mentions how a fresh terror struck upon his soul. It occurs to him that the post office may fail him and the letter will arrive late. Of course, we must remind ourselves that electronic communication was not widespread and certainly not developed enough for detailed messages. So Jekyll's dependence on delivery of the letter was very real. Here, with his confession to this fresh terror, we see a point where the supernatural meets the physical. Jekyll's sinister and unearthly secret is dependent on a very earthly, a very human institution. We also see in this chapter the interplay between the human mind and written language. Of course, this is evident through the whole novel, indeed through most works of literature, but Stevenson highlights this with explicit reference to Jekyll's writing in his notebook. Other than a series of dates, there's little more than brief remarks, but Lanyon notices that early on Jekyll has written, followed by several marks of exclamation, total failure. This, and the evidence before him in Jekyll's belongings, gives Lanyon the sense that Jekyll is suffering from a cerebral disease. This means a disease of the brain or the mind, and indeed Lanyon believes Jekyll to be mentally unwell. These exclamation marks seem typically uncontrolled, for in contrast to Lanyon, Jekyll is a maverick. Of course, you'll remember that it was Lanyon who described Jekyll's science as unscientific balderdash. Stevenson is highlighting here how the written word can reflect our states of mind, and in an epistolary novel made up of several different forms, he's bringing this to the forefront of our interpretation. All words, all marks on the page, all matter. We'll focus on just one more point before bringing this to a close. You'll remember how Jekyll invites Lanyon to witness his drinking of the potion. However, Lanyon notices that Jekyll observes him. He says that Jekyll looked upon me with an air of scrutiny. This small detail is fascinating when we, when we consider the perspectives in the novella. The entire novel feels to be centred on Jekyll's actions, with us as readers and the other characters all peering in and scrutinising Jekyll. Of course, there are other gazes which we can consider, because Jekyll is also looking out, considering those around him. Despite Jekyll's behaviour here, in which he forces Lanyon to witness something so shocking that it kills him, Stevenson highlights Jekyll's own evaluative gaze. It feels uncomfortable and adds to the sense of power and manipulation which Jekyll holds. Despite being a killer and a disloyal liar, he has the audacity to scrutinise Lanyon, his trustworthy, loyal friend. OK, we'll leave it there. I'll be back soon with chapter 10. Thanks for watching and goodbye.